poker's legendary champions, next generation stars, and tireless ambassadors of the game, sharing their wisdom and guiding your journey to high achievement on the green felt. This is Chasing Poker Greatness with your host, Brad Wilson. Welcome, my friend, to another episode of the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast. As always, this is your host, the founder of ChasingPokerGreatness.com, Coach Brad Wilson. And today's guest on CPG is a living legend in the poker and sports betting world who is a treasure trove of amazing, amazing stories. The one and only Steve the Bald Eagle, Zalatau. Steve's path to CPG was pretty unique. I was doing my monthly webinar for PokerCoaching.com when I got a question from Steve Zolato, whose name I totally butchered because my brain was way too slow in making the connection. It was so slow, in fact, that the first question I asked was, oh, are you related to Steve Zolato? Ay, ay, ay. When I finally gathered my wits, I awkwardly asked him out on a date while I was on the job. He gave me his digits and the rest, as they say, is history. Steve's career in the skilled gambling arena has now spanned 50 years, and he has routinely found himself smack dab in the middle of some of the most iconic periods of time in all of gambling lore. Here's a little taste to whet your appetite. Steve was a member of the famous Mayfair Club that used to be the favorite haunt of poker legends Eric Seidel, Stewie Younger, Howard Lederer, Jason Lester, and Paul McGrill. Steve was the first to meet a Caltech analytics wizard, who would go on to change the course of the entire sports betting industry. Today's show with Steve Z will eventually be a two-parter, and maybe more than that if I can convince him to keep coming back on, because locked away in his mind are way, way too many amazing poker stories to unravel in only a couple short hours. So now, without any further ado, strap into your seat and prepare to go on an adventure through the well-lived life of a poker icon, This is Steve Zolotow on Chasing Poker Greatness. Steve, how are you doing, sir? You're not going to blackmail me with any of the things (laughs) I say, right? I don't think so. Anything you say that you want to get taken out, you can tell me to take it out and I'll take it out um, at a price. You have to give like a Miranda (laughs) warning type thing. (laughs) Uh, all right, Steve. Well, welcome to the Chasing Poker Greatness podcast, sir. It's great Thank having you. you. Um, we've made it through some various tech issues, but here we are, safe and secure. How are you doing this afternoon, sir? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm doing quite well. I'm excited to be talking to you. This came about in a strange way. It's a, a strange way for me to get a podcast guest. I was... Um, doing a poker coaching webinar and I saw a question in the chat and I was like, Steven Zala too. And I was like, Hey, wait, is that, are you, I wonder if he's related to Steve Z. And then you're like, Oh no, it is Steve Z. (laughs) So yeah, pretty cool. Um, still taking part in webinars. Just to plug you and the, uh, your crew there, Jonathan Little, uh, I think one of the things that's really good, especially during the pandemic, when you have a lot of time to kill, you know, if you're if you're thinking of, well, should I watch the news tonight or should I watch uh, some TV show, turn on a webinar with one of the poker people and see, you know, and people say when you're a very good player of something, you don't need coaching, you don't need help, you don't need this, but the reality is everybody always has things to learn. And, you know, even the best chess is a good example of these things, because the top chess players in the world have coaches that they could beat easily if they played them. But the chess knows things that can help fill in some of their weaknesses. So I mean, I think I've learned a lot from watching you and Jonathan and Matt Affleck and a bunch of those people on that that show. Right. I appreciate it. I appreciate the plug. And I mean, Roger Federer's got coaches, right? Like every every elite athlete on the planet who's the best at what they do, LeBron James has coaches. Everybody has coaches. And, and there's a reason for that. Because, you know, uh, just multiple reasons, you know, accountability, 
uh, wisdom, life lessons, just very specific areas to target to improve that, like, you know, that um, a general person or general coach can't just like the specificity of coaches can just really help elevate you. And you don't know what you don't know. And there's the, the deal is we talked a little bit about this in the pre-show too, that like, we're all going to die. And I know that I'm going to die and not have everything in poker figured out because I see the complexity of the game. I I'm just aware of it. And I know that like, you can't figure it all out. And so that's, that's the deal with anything that um, is complex, any sport, any activity, pretty much anything. You just, you're never going to learn it all. You're never going to know it all. And you need coaches to help fill in those gaps and, you know, gain an edge. In fact, that's one of the reasons you'll hear a lot of great players talk about other great players and say how terrible they are. And what really happens is, let's say you're a, pretty good player, you make a thousand mistakes. Let's say you're a great player and in the same situation, you only would have made 200 mistakes. So great player A makes 200 and great player B makes 200 mistakes. But they have 100 in common and 100 they each make that the other guy doesn't make. So when I see player B make a mistake that I know is a mistake and that I don't make, I say, boy, that guy's not that good. And when he sees me make a mistake, that he doesn't make, he says, boy, that guy's not that good. And we might be very equal, but we're each looking at the other guy and saying, what a donkey he is. <laughs> Mistakes. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's a greatness bomb straight out of the gate. It's like, there are so many available and possible mistakes, especially in a game like poker, that it's not very hard to pick somebody apart and, and find some clear mistakes that they made. And if the situation is reversed, of course, um, they're going to find tons of mistakes that you've made as well. And that's just the nature of poker because it's a, uh, it's a game of, you know, first of all, like we're clouded by bias and there's so much unknown information that like, sometimes it's even hard to identify mistakes that people make because you may have some, you may have some, some bias, like you've seen the result and that just automatically distorts your perception of how they played the hand. So yeah, it's, it, it's, a uh, it's interesting. It's very tough. You know, I've been watching some of the high roller things on Poker Go because I was at a lot of final tables. And I've been watching me playing and saying, what was I thinking? How could I do that? <laughs> yeah. And watching the other players playing and think, this is supposed to be one of the top players in the world. What was he doing? You know, it's very, it is very easy. And especially when you see all the whole cards, you know, now you're saying, well, it's clear to me he's bluffing. You know, when I was at the table, it wasn't so clear that he was bluffing. Right. Because you're you're trying to find indicators that the villain is bluffing when you know that they are. So, like, you know exactly what you're looking for, and then you can rewind it and watch it 20 times and kind of see it. But, like, when you're in the arena and the pressure's on, there's so many inputs, there's so many different things you're thinking about. Um, strategy, chip stacks, ICM and MTTs. Just like so many different factors, like not trying to give anything away, right? Like just, it's tough. It's tough to navigate and you can't manage all these things at the table every single hand that you play. So things slip through the cracks and, you know, leaks or mistakes are easily found by the observer. But if the roles were reversed, the observer would likely be making many more mistakes in the same exact spot. That is absolutely true. And I mean, especially as you get further away, right now, I think computer wise, they've done a very good job of analyzing limit hold'em and they've shed a lot of light on no limit hold'em. But as you get into games that are less and less well analyzed, nobody knows what's right. And, you know, I played mixed games for a long time. and I grew up in a New York background where we played dealer's choice and you, people would make up a game. You know, it's like, I want to play two boards, one board for high, one board for low, and it's card speak. And the next guy would play a game. Well, we're going to play the same thing, but aces are only ones. They can't count for high. Somebody else would say, well, let's change it a little bit. Let's play high, low, declare. So now you'd be playing declare instead of card speak. And the games were always evolving, and you had to just be quick on your feet figuring out what a game was. So... 
this begs the question, and I want to get into your story, but you kind of opened a door here that is something I think about a lot and I find very interesting. What you, you the way that you ended that there, what a game was. So let's broaden that. And I just want to ask you, like, what is poker, right? Because I think that, like, when you understand sort of the fundamental elements of poker, you can kind of make sense of most of the games. Just they're just changing forms and formats. So to you, you know, what would you say is like fundamentally what's happening in these games um, where you get cards and the best hand is a royal flush and you play it against human beings? Well, I mean, it's a very, you know, it's kind of in all games, there are variations and poker is one of the games with the most variations. If you talk about um, high versus low versus high low. And in a way you say, well, when you're playing low ball, you just flip the ratings around, but you don't really. For example, we'll take an easy case. You're playing stud poker and your opponent catches a deuce. You can say to yourself, well, that's probably a bad card, but it might be very good. He might have two doses in the hole and he just made trips. If you're playing Raz and your opponent catches a king, it can never be a good card, you know? It might not pair him or it might pair him, but it's a for sure bad card. So what cards are good? What cards are bad? Some things are considered poker by some. Like I played at one point a lot of Chinese. I actually won a World Series of Poker bracelet in Chinese poker. And to me, that's a card arrangement game. It's not really a poker game, even though the rank of hands uses poker ranking. Whereas, let's say, as you move to other games, triple draw, deuce to seven. Now, that's a poker game. You're going for deuce to seven type lows. And I don't know how many of your listeners are familiar, but the normal best low hand, if you play most poker games, is ace, two, three, four, five. Some games, you're not allowed to have a straight or a flush. So those count only as high. Induced to seven, the ace is high, and the straights and flushes count against you. So the best hand is two, three, four, five, seven, which isn't a straight, doesn't contain an ace, doesn't contain a pair. You start playing Badoogie, then you can't have two of the same suit. So it's very, you know, where you draw the line of, well, poker goes all the way over to here, but it doesn't include Badoogie. You know, who knows? You know, it's got the same kind of betting patterns. Well, what's the difference in a card arrangement game like Chinese poker and then a game like Deuce to Seven? Well, Deuce to Seven, you have betting and bluffing. Deuce to Seven is actually, in many ways, a much, it's a shorter, sweeter game than Hold'em. You don't have to worry about firing three bullets so much. You know, it's kind of, let's say you pick up, remember, seven, five, four, three, two is the best low hand. So now, you decide you get three fives and two fours, or three deuces and two sevens. You say to yourself, nobody's going to have a very good hand. So I raise, if somebody calls and they draw, I make a big bet. So it's very good. It's no limit. It's a big action game. Now, triple draw, deuce to seven, is the same kind of thing, but it's limit. So the hand values change around because a pat hand is not nearly as good when your opponent is going to have three chances to draw against you versus when they have one chance to draw against you. But, uh, and you fold know, equity is going to be a lot less too, I would assume, in a limit right. game. Limit you know, game, like you always have great pot odds, and so you're going to be calling a lot, especially like after the third draw. And uh, no limit game with one draw, my assumption is like there's more fold equity to be had. I think that's absolutely true. Well, in general, my... My thing that I would tell a student if I was coaching somebody is that in limit games on the river, your default option is always to call. In other words, there's 10 bets in the pot. <laughs> yeah. Call one more bet, you call. Mm -hmm. And unless you have a really, really strong reason, you know, you can't beat his board or whatever it happens to be, you know, then you could fall. Yeah, they turn and their cards call. over and you see that they win. <laughs> <laughs> no limit it's the reverse when they make a pot size bet on the end you're getting two to one odds but unless you have a really strong reason to call your default is to fold you know it's a it's a very different situation well so it's 
The, what's interesting is I think this people still overfold and hold them too because like even getting two to one is like thirty three percent equity to win right and, and like that's not a high number and, and like it's easy to over bluff in a lot of situations um, in a limit game getting like ten to one or fifteen to one I mean we're talking like single digits um, equity that we need to call a bet on the river and that's like just a slam dunk every time except the big trap and. <clears throat> And this is sort of interesting because I just played this hand for in the heads up end of a mixed game tournament at the high roller tournament. So there's a lot of money involved and we get to limit hold them. And my opponent was bluffing. I raised, he re-raised. Won't bore you with the details of the hand. Now he bet Eli this was, who's a very Elezra? player. Well, Ellie, easy, Ellie Alesra? Right. So we're heads up. I mean, I'll tell you, my hand was, I think, queen seven suited. I'm the button, heads up. I raise, he calls. The flop comes ace, queen, small card with two diamonds. I bet. He checks, I bet. He raises. Now the board pairs the ace. He bets, I call. Now in the end, some low blank hits, and he bets again. I'm getting a really great price to call. So the obvious play is to call, except he knows that I have some kind of a good hand. He knows I'm going to call. So would he keep on bluffing in this situation? And I thought about it and I said, well, you know, we're playing for a lot of money. Is he really going to try a three barrel bluff in limit poker? So I threw my hand away. And he had a diamond draw, so my pair of things was good, you know. And you say to yourself afterwards, "What, what the, fu- what the f was I thinking?" You know, we can like, say the f word. You're, you're, okay. it's, it's okay. <laughs> so, you know, it's like I look at the video and I say, "I can't believe it." The commentator is saying, "He can't believe it," but you know, in the spur of the moment, it just seemed like, well, he knows I'm going to call, so he wouldn't possibly be bluffing, so I can fold safely, and he was you know i mean he he outthunk me whatever you want <laughs> see the the interesting thing about limit hold'em is like you always get a good price to call right but you also always get a really good price to bluff like <laughs> like on the river it's like well if they fold like one out of every eight times then i then it's it's a good bet right so like that's why it's like yeah they never fold but like you're getting such a good price to bluff so you kind of have to and then they're getting such a great price to call so they kind of have to call and that's just like uh this is a funny quirk of limit limit poker that like interestingly um when i came up in the game there was really no hold'em uh, no limit hold'em cash games it was pretty much all tournaments and limit hold'em in like 2004 was like all that was really spread um so i played a lot of limit hold'em and like interestingly I was awful at Limit Hold'em. I'm most likely still pretty awful at Limit Hold'em, but I at least understand the game a lot better than I did 15 years ago, just by virtue of understanding equities and how things work and, and like the pot odds model being very intimate with that. I, I think that like my Limit game is probably stronger than it's ever been, and yet I haven't played a hand of Limit Hold'em in um, 16 years or so. <laughs> well, you know, I think it's something that people find is when you play other games, even just for fun or variety, you learn something about your game or your specialty game because you see a situation comes up and you say, hey, I can take this PLO situation and I can apply apply what I've learned here to a Hold'em situation or vice versa. Limit to no limit, the same kind of thing. You know, it's a, I mean, in theory, all of these things, if you go with poker theory, there's an, minimum defensive frequency for any size bet, certainly on the river when there's no check raising and whatever, this is just it. There's no future future odds to worry about. And yet, when you put things into a solver, which allegedly is calculating everything, the solver in certain situations won't call anywhere close to what the minimum defensive frequency is. And what it's doing is it's factoring in how it would have played previously, and it can't find enough bluffs out of its out of the cards it has to have a bluff on the river. Yeah, because we programmed it to have a specific range, right? Like that's sort of we've we've put the inputs in there, and like it's a 
recurring theme on this show that like I think solvers are great tools, they're very powerful, but like they're giant calculators and they rely on the inputs that you use to give you the outputs. And so if you mess up the inputs, whether it be in sizing, whether it be in like preflop range, whether it be in, you know, options, like in some spots, do you give villain a donk bet? Um, if you don't, and like some boards should be um, led into from the preflop caller, then like that's going to change the output. And, and it's just very easy. You can start shifting and changing things, just very minor, and start seeing the influence that those tiny tweaks have on the outcomes. And that to me makes me a little afraid, right? It's like, hmm, when can I trust the output here? And also like, I think that just, there's just a lot of people who have been sort of misled as it relates to optimal poker strategy by just trying to blindly kind of follow PIO outputs when they don't really resemble any reality that the the player is going to ever play in. Exactly. I mean, and, and no one can memorize and there's such, you know, just if you were to take a thing or a chart, let's say the most basic chart of what hands do I start with from what position? Then you say, well, how does this change with stack size? How does it change if there's a nanny? How does it change if the big blind is a loose maniac? How does it change if the big blind is a rock? You know, and you just, you're at the most basic level and yet little changes and tweaks throw everything around. Yeah, I have a course called Preflop Bootcamp and it's like 65 grids, all simplified to like absolute strategy. So no mixing. And it's just like a strong model for playing preflop. And there are people that, stick in the program for like three or four months because it's very difficult to even commit to memory like 65 grids for all of these specific situations with no mixing at all now when when we started adding in mixing of like sometimes you call sometimes you three bet sometimes you know you limp from the small blind and then you limp raise like anytime you start splitting ranges in multiple places the complexity just goes exponential and then like execution drops to just horrible horrible like zero percent nobody can execute the strategy and if you can't execute a strategy no matter how great it is it's not very useful i mean you, it really is beyond human capabilities to do all of these things if you really could program the computer properly it also would have its own sort of internal hud head up display so now the computer would say oh this guy puts money into the pot too often. It'd be iterating, yeah. I go to strategy 89 as opposed to strategy 9. Exactly. This guy does this, and you know, you would, you would immediately get way, way beyond what any human person could accomplish. Yeah, I think there are some like pluribus AI machine learning that do do that, um, that are, you know, trying to basically be a better version of humans. But even then those programs can't really do much when they get like 156 big blinds. Like they have to reset stacks to a hundred big blinds before every single hand. Otherwise, like it's very hard for them to learn, grow and iterate even with like machine learning and artificial intelligence. And if you play in real live cash games, let's say you might play, uh, let's say Mirage where I play very often, or Aria, where I play very often, you take a 510 game, there might be people sitting there with 5,000, 500 big blinds in front of them. And then really the pre-flop stuff, it's not unimportant, but you don't want to be making, you know, you play a pair of deuces and you flop three deuces. How happy are you getting in for 500 big blinds with a set? You know, it's like... Depends well, on the player. You know, <laughs> you know, what is this guy putting all his money in with? You know, right. it's like... You know, the same thing with King's preflop. It's like, oh, 100 big blinds, 50 big blinds, sure, I'm getting all in. 500 big blinds, at some point, you're, the red light is going off in your mind saying, well, does he really make the fifth bet, the fifth raise with, without aces? Yeah. And, I mean, you know, it, that, e even preflop, right? Like, even you have, you, you've memorized your 65 grids for 100 big blind preflop. Congratulations. Now you've got 200 big blinds and all the grids change. <laughs> now yep. you have totally different strategies at 200 big blinds versus 100 big blinds that you also need to co commit to memory. It's just, you know, 
it's just very easy to see how the complexity of this game is like it, it just it's something you can't overcome as a human being and so you just have to do the best that you can and learn and study and grow and like when you encounter these problems and you need to learn a better 200 big blind strategy for a preflop, then like you just dive in and you just do the work and try to do as good a job as you can. But like, ultimately you're not going to be able to execute it cleanly. You're going to make mistakes and that's the nature of the game. And it's just, luckily we play against human beings and the human beings that make the fewest mistakes over the course of their lives are the ones that end up making the money. So if you can just make fewer mistakes than the folks you play against, you'll end up making money. That is exactly right. I mean, and also, you know, one of the things you have in poker, other than tournament poker, but if you're playing live, you have a choice of games. You know, you're not, if I'm, let's say, playing 510 at Aria on a Friday night and my game is no good, I can get a table change to one of three other tables. You know, and that, if I can't find somebody I think is playing badly, I can say, well, maybe I should just play 2-5, or maybe I should play 10-20, or maybe, you know, it's like, you're not, you know, I would again suggest this to people in general, you're going to the casino, assuming you go to a casino where there are a bunch of games, put your list, your name on the list for all the games that you think might remotely be appropriate for you. Then when they call you, you can always say, no, I'm happy where I am. But if you're not happy where you are, you've moved up the list. There's nothing worse than having some live one come into the casino, get into a game, and now you're 89th on the list and the button <laughs> goes broke and suddenly they call the list and the game breaks up. So it's, you know, being on, on lists is always a good policy. Yeah, and, you know, Melissa Burr said it very well, too. She plays high stakes and nosebleed mixed games. And she said that, like, her goal was just to be able to walk into any poker room and just to be able to play in the best game that was running, whatever that game is, um, which meant that she needs to learn all the games so that she can play in whatever she views or sees the best game running at the time. And I think that, like, that's something that is very beneficial to aspiring poker pros' careers have options, right? Like with options, you know, it's tough to find, it's tough to walk into a card room and be like, there's no table in here where I have an edge, right? Um, of a couple of the, just continuing this a little further, of the biggest losers who I've at least slightly played with in my Las Vegas history, Larry Flint played only stud. There was a Greek guy, George, he liked only PLO. There was Andy Beal from the billionaire from Texas. He liked limit hold'em, especially heads up limit hold'em. You know, so you go down the list of people and not everybody wants to play no limit hold'em for nosebleed stakes. I mean, right now with television and whole card cameras, it's very popular, but you never know what somebody's going to want to play. So you should at least be willing to play a little bit with them in their game. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta enter. You get, you have to again. Sort of going back to what, what my question earlier of like, what is poker, right? I think like when when you try to when you understand like how equities work, how fold equities work, how pot odds work, just like all the little different pieces of each game, the l little different pieces of the puzzle, then you can adapt very well, and you can be pretty flexible as it relates to switching games and learning new games. And the reality is like, there's a lot of information out there in the world about no limit Texas Hold'em, which means the learning curve is very high. But in games where the learning curve is not so high, you don't need to be a world beater to be able to have an edge in a game where nobody knows what the hell is going on, right? Like you just need to be better than those guys who are totally clueless and don't really even understand how poker works. I mean, in my life, from the time I stopped working, let's say in my early 30s, which is getting on toward uh, over, over 45 years ago, let's say, I've played successfully. I played a little bit of bridge. I never got that good at it. Although I've gotten better during the pandemic, I've been playing again. A lot of backgammon where I won some championships. A, and I don't play that anymore. I've played Klabiash. Then I got involved in a sports betting group where we bet on 
pro football and pro basketball, and we had one of the earliest good computer models, and we did very well. Then in more recent years, it's been mostly poker. I've always played poker in the background, but it's never been necessarily my primary focus up until the last 20 years or so. Okay, so this segues perfectly into officially the first question of the podcast, (laughs) which is the story of how you got involved playing cards and games and just what led you to the world of gambling in general. Well, as a kid, my parents were both writers, but my father loved games, and I played a lot of games with him, you know, pretty much from the age of five or six, I was playing chess and checkers and bridge and poker and, you know, who knows, who knows what other weird games, and uh, so that was always got me interested, and then initially I wanted to be an actor. I was studying acting. How come? How come I wanted to be an actor? Yeah, and how how old were you? When was this? This would have been in my pre-teens on through my teens. Um, I was allegedly very talented, but I was I had a very poor ego for going to auditions. So I would go to one audition, get turned down, and then go home and cry for a week, as opposed to the people who would go to five auditions a day and they were like a rock. Yeah, you you were the poker player that got aces cracked, and then you just <laughs> fell totally to pieces. <laughs> right. Back, and uh, probably the high point of my acting career was when I was still in high school. I did a mostly, I was the white lead in a mostly black play that we did at the actor's studio. And my co-star, who was black, I still see on television all the time. He was just in Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Glenn Turnan. And, you know, I was good. I was competent, but I really, and as I got into college, I couldn't support myself acting. And I had always played games, as we said. So I started trying to support myself playing small stake poker and bridge and whatever. And that kind of led me uh, to drop out of college. This was mid sixties. So by then drugs were becoming very popular. This was a a zone in time when everyone had been very straight for years. And then suddenly they had drugs were popular. Most of the guys like myself figured we were going to go to Vietnam and be killed anyway. So it didn't matter what we did. They had just invented birth control and nobody knew about things like AIDS. So you suddenly had Everybody was on the pill. It was wild sex, wild drugs. And so I kind of went nuts for about five or so years. And then uh, then came back to New York and kind how, of... How did playing games go during that five to six years of <laughs> doing not, drugs and having not, sex? Not, not as well as it might have. <laughs> I was playing a very small stake. In those days in Gardena, California, you could play draw poker only. And I was playing one and two draw and barely holding on. It's like I would go to the bridge club, let's say, and lose $20 and have to give them a check for 50 that was no good and take the $30 out to Gardena, try and make enough to cover the check and have money to <laughs> eat and all of that stuff. The only, the only good thing was my uh, girlfriend, wife, whatever she became, and I were doing a little bit of porn, which brought in some money. So we had like an income source. That have, have to have to for, so. Let's pause. Yeah. How, how did that happen? How did that career come about? Well, I was living with a woman named Madeline and she was bi. And so we were allowed to, I've always been straight, but she could go out with other girls or other guys. I could go out with other girls, but if either of us met a girl who was really great, our goal was to try and bring her home for a three-way. So now I got drafted. I was in the army. I mean, I, all of these things, stories could take a full podcast, but (laughs) we got time. We got time. (laughs) I got thrown out of the army for inability to adapt. I was very anti the war in Vietnam at a time when that was not a popular stance. I was beaten up. My captain was afraid I'd commit suicide like some 
some other people nearby had done. So he said, I'm going to get you out. And he put me to work for a month typing in the office. And then I was thrown out after about a total of two months. When I came back to LA, and my former girlfriend was living with a guy who was a porn photographer. So I stayed on their couch. And the first morning, all these women come in and start taking off clothes. And I'm like, wow. I mean, I've been in Georgia for two months. And now suddenly gorgeous women are coming in and taking off their clothes. And there was, I would say one who was super beautiful, three who were beautiful, and one or two who were okay. So I'm talking to one of the middle group who's working for the post office and she doesn't understand zip codes, which was a new thing they had put in. So she was thinking of making porn a full-time career versus post office. And (laughs) my old friend Madeline comes in and says, let's go to breakfast. And I said, no, I'm comfortable here. You know, I just like to hang out, chat with you. She said, no, you have to go. So I'm sleeping on her couch, so I have to go to breakfast. And she says, what do you think of the girls? And I said, well, one super beautiful, three beautiful, whatever. She says, okay, I really want to make it with the beautiful girl, but I think she's straight. So I'm going to try and fix you up with her so that then you can get the three-way set. <laughs> okay, for you, dear, I'll sacrifice my body, my mind. I'll do whatever I have to do. So now... It's taking a bullet for the team. Right. So we all go out and we liked each other, but she had a boyfriend who was a rock musician. So at that point, she wasn't available. To give you an idea of how quickly all of this moved, this was, let's say, early November. By the middle of November, I had my own place. By Thanksgiving, I was playing in Gardena and I'm sitting at home, Thanksgiving and the phone rings and I don't think anyone has my number except this old girlfriend and my mother. So I answer expecting one of those two. And it's this the super beautiful girl who says, I hope it's okay for me to call you. Madeline gave me your number. I said, sure. And she said, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, it's Thanksgiving and I'm alone and I'm kind of depressed. What are you doing? He said, well, I'm fighting with my boyfriend. Why don't I come over and cheer you up? And I said, okay. The next day, she went home and got her dog in her suitcase. Two weeks later, we went to Vegas. And when the drugs and money ran out, we got married. <laughs> so that was, uh, well, why the married? Why the married, Steve? I don't know. There didn't seem anything else to do. I mean, who knows what, was, what we were thinking at that point in, <laughs> our, in our existence. Okay. And, so you got married. What, the he- what happened after you got married? Well, we were... We lived together for a while, and whenever we had a fight, I'd go back to Madeline, or she'd go off to something, and we had a kid, and then by then we were both, she liked up-type things more, and I liked down-type things more in terms of drugs, so we were kind of on different planets, and then I was losing a lot of weight, and I came back to New York and just kind of said, no more craziness, no more marriage. I rehabbed myself. I went... My mother helped me get a job at Harper and Row, which was a publishing company. I worked in the financial area doing financial stuff, computer stuff. I started back up as a dropout from Columbia. I started back up at NYU. I went for a five-year BS MBA program, so I got an MBA. And then I was all set to start submitting my resume to, you know, brokerage-type companies. Probably if I had stuck on that path, I'd be one of those people where you say, the company just lost money this year and you got a $5 million bonus. How did that happen? (laughs) Um, So now at this point, I had just won a backgammon tournament and I was fighting with the company I was working for. So I said, well, before I send out my resume, why don't I just take a little time off? And during the time off, I attempted to become a bookmaker with not, with limited success. I could find customers, they would lose, but I was never very good at collecting. <laughs> that, was, yeah. that was a big drawback to being a bookmaker. And But I got involved with some very sharp sports bettors. So now I was mostly playing backgammon, betting on sports. Well, how did you get involved with the sharp sports bettors back in those days? Well, 
they were always looking for outlets. So I was a source of outlets as a customer. As they were laying, I, laying off, right? I had put money. I had put, I had a, what's known as a half sheet. I don't know how familiar you are. I don't even know if these things exist anymore, <laughs> but a half sheet is a bookmaker gives you what's known as a half sheet. You guarantee your players they provide the office, the service, the lines, take care of everything, and then give you the figure for your customer at the end of the week. So you have to collect from the losers, pay the winners, and you split the profits with them. It's a franchise, basically. It's a franchise, basically, exactly. And it's a very good model for a bookmaker because suddenly you have a lot of different customers. And it's a very good model for the people who do what I was doing are called agents. And some of the people I knew from playing bridge or playing backgammon turned out to have contacts who were very good at sports betting. So suddenly I was meeting good sports bettors. Then I would talk to them. Then somebody introduced me to a guy who was a Caltech super whiz, and he helped with the creation of some betting systems. So I gave him a free role and I was moving the money. And when I started, to give you an idea of how slow lines were initially, I could bet a game in New York at six o'clock and at 7.30, I could bet the same game at the same line. Two years later, we had crushed so many people that if we bet a game at six o'clock, at two minutes after six, the line would have moved basically all over the world. And I, wow. went, I went from having just myself, then I had a friend who was a bridge player, then I had another friend who helped with the figures, then somebody who's been very much bad mouthed but is really a good guy, Howard Letterer, came on to help me with the sports betting. And he was one of the people who was in charge of full tilt when it went down. And so he he certainly has responsibilities to bear, but He's gotten a lot more heat than he ever deserved for an honest guy who was a poker player, not a businessman, and trying to run a business. You know, so uh, he, what are we talking back in these days? You know, you say you, you the line used to not move for an hour and a half, and when y'all got through with them, it would move a few minutes later. Like, how how much are we getting down on these bets? Well, we were trying to get to, and remember, it's a group of us by the time we're reaching the end, mm -hmm. plus a lot of people trying to follow us. So we have like a guy in Detroit. We had two guys in Detroit who would move games for us, Detroit Joe and Motown Jeff. So now we have two people in Detroit. We had a guy in northern Nevada. We had a guy who was a poker player, David Gray, who you might know. I do. A six game player was moving for us in Las Vegas. So we had people all over helping us move. California, New York, Florida, whatever. And so that maybe we would be trying, you know, it would depend on the sport, what you thought you could get down on and how hard the number was. But let's say there's a basketball game that's mostly four, but a little bit of three and a half, and you want to lay three and a half. You might be able to get twenty or thirty thousand dollars of three and a half, and then the line would be four or four and a half everywhere. If it was something where you thought the line was really way off, so you were happy to lay three and a half and four, you might get down for $150,000. And then we had to start doing phonies because too many people were following us and stealing our numbers. So we'd order three and a half on the side that we wanted to bet against. Then when the line went to five, we take back four times as much plus five as we had laid three and a half. So that kind of, you know, so it, it got to be a, then of course we had the government to deal with. I was declaring myself as a consultant and a gambler and paying taxes that they didn't know. They didn't know this was called voluntary compliance. It's somebody like a poker player wins a lot in a cash game. The IRS doesn't know. So when you say, Hey, I want a hundred thousand this year, now the IRS knows, and it's voluntary compliance, and you would think they would be very happy. But the police thought we were bookmakers, even though at this time we weren't doing any bookmaking. So they closed us down in New York, then we moved to Vegas, then they closed us down in Vegas. And 
They seized about $2 million out of boxes and sports betting accounts and casinos. And they said, well, we're going to have you do 20 years. And the other choice is let us keep the money and then you won't do any jail time. Holy shit. Now we knew we were just bargaining about money. And then the lawyers got a big piece, but basically they settled for about a third of the money they had confiscated. And uh, I said, no more sports betting. Let me go on to other things. And that was when I started more actively getting involved in poker. So I know that like Billy Walters got into some hot water in the last few years with the Phil Mickelson deal, but like he, he, it, it feels like he, he kept going, right? Like he, he kept going until very recently. It was our big competition and he took over our handicapper. Gotcha. Our, our model computer model guy moved into the Billy Walters camp. I mean, Billy Walters got into hot water over insider trading stuff, you know, and it was very, I like Billy. I mean, he's a friendly, funny guy, but he also has a sort of evil streak in that his outlook on gambling is he wants to make all the money and he doesn't want the people who are helping him to make anything significant that might cut into his earnings. My theory was I want to be a good guy and if everybody makes money, we'll all do well. So I wanted the people helping me to do well. So I wasn't trying to screw anybody who was helping me, whereas he has, I'll just say it's a reputation. We we won't say whether it's a proven reputation or not, but for uh, doing things that left people in the lurch. Yeah. So it's, it's um, what's good for the gander is good for the goose, right? That's the, the policy. The decision to enter a hand is fundamental to poker strategy. Too tight and they know what you have. Too loose, and you're easy to run over. Free Flop Bootcamp from Chasing Poker Greatness is a comprehensive guide to locking down your pre-flop game and creating true range advantage. Eight days of guided training, over 60 optimal ranges, and access to a dedicated community of players that will push your pre-flop game from a place of weakness to your greatest strength. Go to ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash bootcamp. Available now. John, I wanted to ask you why you decided to invest in a pre-flop bootcamp. Everything that you had done with me to that point, or I had heard you do, had impressed me. I love the podcast. I accidentally ended up in the poker power hour and loved that. And then I took coaching and then you recommended the boot camp. And at first I didn't think it was, you know, something that would be that valuable. But I was like, everything else has been amazing. So I signed up and then it just blew me away. And what about boot camp blew you away? Like it started off slow, like I'm learning these ranges and I'm not even understanding what you're talking about. And then all of a sudden, as I start to understand what we're doing with the three bets, the four bets, all of a sudden it just kind of hit me. And I was like, oh my God, how do I not know this stuff? This is amazing. The more I studied them, I started to understand why they were constructed sometimes. Like I'd be like, that's why that's like that. And that would lead to more revelations and just a better understanding of poker in general. Do you have any interesting takeaways from your boot camp experience? The most interesting thing about the boot camp, it's a pre-flop boot camp, but I feel like it's done as much for my post game as it did for my pre-game, just because I'm not in as many awkward and bad situations as I found myself in. You know, when we were doing coaching before the boot camp, we couldn't get through 10, 15 minutes of tape without finding mistake after mistake. And then once we did the boot camp, it solved problems on the back end as well. I know you've studied for a thousand hours this year. How do you think boot camp compares to your other poker study? Oh, it's crazy. The boot camp is probably the most important thing I've done all year out of everything. I would give anything to go back and to, to know that stuff 10 years ago. I can't imagine how successful I'd be right now 
if I had known that stuff. And I thought the boot camp was so valuable that I literally insisted you take more money from me and paid you more for the boot camp because I was blown away. I just thought the price was too cheap. And it's changed my game in ways that I, I can't even explain to you. If you'd like to join the next round of Preflop Boot Camp, which starts on the last Saturday of every month, head to ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash bootcamp to lock up your spot. One more time, that's ChasingPokerGreatness.com slash bootcamp. So sports comes crashing down. How were you in life? Like financially, I assume you had done well um, despite getting these millions of dollars uh, confiscated and then getting paying the lawyers and getting most of it back. Or I don't even know. I don't even want to know how much you actually got back after the lawyers and the, the government's cut. Well, you know, I had, when I left school, I had student debts. I paid off my student debts through gambling I established some kind of a bankroll, you know, to where I was comfortable and then I could relax and play poker and, uh, and really to some extent not worry too much about stuff as long as when you're playing super high, there's almost no amount of money in a bankroll that's safe. In other words, I played in Larry Flint's game, which was done 1,503,000 limit and the last hour or two, we'd go to two and four thousand limit. What year was this? Probably about 10, 12 years ago. Um, and many of the people, probably bad to mention names, but many of the most successful players. You're talking about a guy who probably over a couple of years lost 20, 30, 40 million. And some of the biggest winners in that game are now broke. Wow. Um, you say to yourself, and some of them are famous, good poker players. They just kept on playing huge against people who were better or had too much ego or they didn't adapt to new games or, you know, they had other bad habits, you know, all of the, all of the typical things. And I was always more of a, I'm worried about how well I can sleep, not about how well I can eat. I don't need a Ferrari or a yacht. I'm perfectly happy with my, my jeans and my t-shirts and going to the places I like. Yeah, you know, 20 years ago, you were just sleeping on your ex-girlfriend's couch and uh, <laughs> doing porn to make ends meet, right? <laughs> Two years ago, I was sleeping on people's couches. And uh, now if I don't have my own bathroom, I feel like, boy, this is really roughing it. You know? <laughs> there are a bathroom. It's that, I mean, it seems like that would, that would have been a very exciting time. I mean, you were kind of a trailblazer building the model to bet sports, finding the, the right guy from Caltech to help build that model out. I mean, and then placing these massive wagers on games across the country, moving the line, playing the games. You know, it's very, being a, with people who are trailblazers. I played in New York at a club called the Mayfair Club, which went on to be a poker club. It was originally a bridge club and then backgammon took over. And in backgammon, people have been playing for thousands of years, and a mathematician, Paul McGreal, analyzed the game and revolutionized the game, and he was a Mayfair player. So I was always friendly with Paul. He was the worst gambler you can imagine, and a great theoretician. He was a poker player, and X-22 was his poker name. Yeah, the quack quack. Quack quack, right. And uh, I'll tell you my, you know, I sort of subsidized him for the last not individually, but I was among the group of people who was giving him enough money to survive for the last five or ten years of his life. And uh, why was he such point, a bad gambler? Because he enjoyed the games. You know, it's like why does somebody call in the river when they know they're beaten? They want to prove that they were right. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's a famous story about him that he and another backgammon player who is a big believer in luck or playing craps together. And he, they turned to Eric Seidel and Paul McGreal says, well, who do you think is stupider? Billy, who thinks he can beat craps and is playing, or me, who knows you can't beat craps and I'm playing with him. <laughs> you know, so it's, uh, and he actually taught me 
one of the few winning crap systems, if you want to know a winning crap system, although you'll become hated very quickly, <laughs> go to a casino where they have something like 10 times or better odds. Then you bet and you take a weird amount of odds. Like, let's say you bet $9 and you take 23 in odds. Eventually, they screw up the payoffs. And when they screw up the payoffs, especially if it's a busy table, if they screw up against you, you correct them. If they screw up in your favor, you take it. <laughs> it makes you universally unpopular with all of the floor men, the people dealing craps, all of those people. But it is a way to eke out some kind of an advantage at craps. Well, I mean, it, it's a, a way to play craps and not go broke. So that's, that's, that's a thing. That's a positive. I mean, the other thing you can do is if you have friends who like craps, you go along with them. And if they don't take the maximum amount of odds, you just take their odds. So you have an even money gamble, just kind of free riding on your friend's odds. <laughs> I mean, I've never been a big fan of craps. It just was sort of boring to me. Well, I should tell you, I have one more very good Paul McGreal story. Uh, this is a, maybe three or four years back. He gives backgammon lessons online and occasionally to very rich people, but he charges his poor students and his rich students the same thing. And one day he comes to me and he says, you have to lend me $500. I said, why? You know, you already owe me a lot. And he said, well, I absolutely need it. And I said, well, why do you need it? And he said, if I don't get $500, they're going to cut my cocks off. <laughs> said, How many do you have? You know, what are you talking about? Get your cocks off. And he said, no, no, Cox, my internet provider. They're going to Cox, my internet provider. And I take your lessons. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God. So that was, uh, but he revolutionized backgammon. So the people who played at the Mayfair and were friends with Paul knew, basically, if you didn't play at the Mayfair, we didn't know you, and we knew we were better than you. You know, it was sort of like, if I meet a backgammon player who I don't know, I know I'm better than he is. And in the sports, it was kind of the same thing, you know. I mean, the first people who, you know, again, if you could go back with what we know now and start playing poker in uh, 30 years ago, you would have said, boy, these people are really, the best players are making all these mistakes. Would have been astonished. Sure. I mean... Yeah. That's always the case though, right? I think like that's the that's sort of like the challenge, the sort of the silly comparisons of like the players from the 60s and the players from the day and like comparing them and it's like yeah, like the players from today built their lives standing on the shoulders of what all those guys learned back then and took those training techniques and, you know, nutrition and performance and all the stuff and then just incrementally improved it over time to where it looks significantly different because but you needed you needed the early era of people to get to where we are today exactly and you know it's like people also always look back on how good well i'll give you another long do, you, do we have time for a longer story yeah let's go okay uh i used to play in a small stake stud game in new york this was when i was still working and i'd been invited to the game and the best player was somebody who was a degenerate horse player. And we called him Howie the Horse. Every night he would win at poker. Every day he would go out to the track and lose, very often coming back in debt. Then he would win that night. And this went on for about a year. And by now I was playing in the game. One or two of the bad players had gone broke. Another good player got in. And finally he went on a poker losing streak. So now he's losing at the track by day and losing at poker by night. And it's disastrous. So to keep himself away from the track, he gets a job during the day as a bartender. And we go in to give him some business at the bar. And he's pouring his shots and we're telling stories. And he says, you know, I thought in that poker game that the candy store was always open. It didn't matter what I did. But you have to learn that sometimes the candy store is not going to be open anymore. And that I've seen applied to so many things. For example, when Blackjack first came to Atlantic City, they had early surrender and sloppy dealers. You thought you just had to go to Atlantic City every day or every weekend, and you could make as much money as you could blow off. When they legalized 
games besides draw poker in California, you could make as much money as you wanted. You know, they're just, these people have no clue. And over and over, when online poker first took off, everyone thought, oh, it doesn't matter how much I lose in the casino. You know, I can go back on full tilt, or back on poker stars, or back on party poker, and make it back in a week. So it's, you just have to realize situations dry up. And it's very important when you can make money in a spot, make your money, hold on to it, invest some, you know. I'm not saying you have to live in poverty, but, you know, building a bankroll is very important. Yeah, it like Mike Garrow said it, you know, many years ago that like, that's our way of making money. It's like a your bankroll is your printing press. And like, if you're a printer, you don't sell your printing press because then you can't make any more money in the future, right? So like keeping your bankroll safe and, you know, I've talked about it many times on Chasing Poker Greatness, but like, I, I think that the more of a bankroll you have, the more worthy of protection it ought to be. So like, if you build up a sizable bankroll, dusting it off is way more painful than, you know, dusting off like whatever, you know, five or 10,000 that you can replace a few hundred thousand is probably going to take a lot longer to start to replace from zero dollars. I mean, when you take a look at some of the people who've had 5 million, 10 million and gone broke, I mean, that's, it's not like you'd say, well, I'm going to get a job at McDonald's and make it up in a couple of weeks. You know, you, you, you might never get back there. You know, it's a, uh, Again, I don't want to mention names of people, but you know some of them are pretty famous for the roller coaster rides they've been on, and it's uh, amazing to me. What is um, sort of the biggest pitfall that you've seen, or the biggest trap, or the biggest lie that people tell themselves that gets them in that situation? I think well, there are two things. One is people often think, no matter what it is, that they know more than they know. Like, let's say somebody is a sports better. Mike Sexton, for example, was a degenerate sports better. And it's not that he didn't know about sports. He probably knew way more about sports than I did when I was making a fortune. But I knew about numbers. And I knew this is a good number and we should bet it. He knew, well, the center hurt his ankle in the last game and he's questionable and whatever. We just had a number and we went with our number. You know, the people who play poker... Somebody wins a poker tournament, and not that they're necessarily a bad player, but now they've won a tournament and they think, oh, I can play with anybody. And, you know, it's a much, when you go from 1 2 or 1 3 to 2 5 to 5 10 to 10 20, the games get tougher and tougher and tougher. And you I mean, you just see it, you know, from the people you play. I mean, it's when I'm waiting for a seat, I play 2 5 sometime, and I see, is four people limp and it's up to me. And when I play 10, 20 or 25, 50, nobody ever limps. You know, maybe once, once in a blue moon, somebody walks in with a bunch of casino chips and there's an open seat and sits down. But basically, people don't limp. They first in raises, period. What was the second thing? We said we had, we had two. Well, the, the, the thinking you know more than you know, I think, is the big thing. And the other one is being disciplined. You know, it's saying, I'm, even if I'm in a very good situation, how much of my net worth am I willing to risk? You yeah. Know, uh, I think as it relates to the first one, you know, we're just so biased, especially with sports. I think, like, I was thinking about it uh, a year or so ago, just like, driving down the road and thinking about how like how biased we are to like our team or the players or just how we envision them this sort of abstract idea of like how they're going to perform when like really like you said it's a number right it's rooted in math and like you don't get to beat math and like if somebody's model is just really 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 good then it doesn't matter how much you know about the center's ankle it's not going to be enough to overcome um, just the pure math of it, right? Like, we're just very biased as human beings. And like, that's, that's our downfall with this stuff. You know, and people will tell you stuff that everybody, that the bookmaker knows, that all the other bettors know, and they feel like, well, this is, I'm the only one who knows that he hurt his ankle. In sure, the, in right. The, he's questionable for the playoff, the first game of the playoffs, or whatever it happens to be, you know, 
that's common knowledge. It's like when somebody raises under the gun, they probably have a good hand. It's not like <laughs> right. you know something that nobody else knows. Right. Like Billy's Billy Walters is out there, ha- has like trainers and getting information like immediately or just like has all this intel that can influence things. And like you're, you're not going to find stuff out faster than those guys. It's just not possible. Exactly right. And, you know, and, and it goes for pretty much, you know, now let's say for whatever you, you decide you want to play uh, No Limit Hold'em at a certain level and you're doing well and you decide I'm going to move up to the next level. So when do you move up? How much do you risk when you move up? I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer in, let's say, if you have a poker bankroll, you might take 5% of it and say, okay, this is going to be my taking shots bankroll for 5%. I have a hundred thousand. I'm going to put five thousand that I allow myself to take shots with instead of playing two five. If I see the five ten game looks good, I'll jump in the five ten game. You know, it's not like I'm committed to it. I'm not afraid to go back. You know, another thing is somebody will say, "Well, I'm a two and four hundred player. I'm never going back to the to whatever it is, even when the two and four hundred game is really really bad, and they should go back." You know, they, they get ego involved with things. Well, how did this play out in, you know, your early sports betting career? When I have to imagine, like, you know, you have bankroll considerations there, right? How did you mitigate risk placing these large, way- or, you know, w- were your lines, was your guy just so good that, like, the variance wasn't, you know? Well, well as we, I was very good at betting and finding numbers initially, especially when you're betting small, it's much easier because sure. let's say 90% of the bookmakers are at four. There's 5% at four and a half and 5% at three and a half. So when you're betting small, you can lay three and a half or you could take four and a half. So you're already picking up a, almost equalizing the juice by just finding a good number. Then I had a very good feel for whether people were going to bet on a team early or late. So let's say I would know, we'll bet as soon as the bookmakers open. Or Where'd wait. that feel come from? I don't know. I mean, I just sort of intuited what people were doing. That, you know, we were in New York, so I knew that there would be a lot of New York fans and they might rush in on their way to the Nick game. Then, right? You're a numbers guy, Steve. This, in, this mm-hmm. intuition has to come from somewhere, right? Well, I mean, I guess I saw it probably in the back of my mind, the pattern sunk in. and. Then I was getting the numbers from this guy, and I'd say, well, let's play this game first and this game last. But now also, in the beginning, as I say, I was betting very small. I had one person helping me for a while and then a girl doing figures. And, you know, we had, we weren't trying to crush the number. We weren't trying to bet all over the world. And we weren't even sure it was that good. And now, by the time things got really good, to give you an idea, If you take a game, let's say um, the line on a game is seven, and you like the underdog, so you take, and your model says the line should be pick them. So that's a huge difference. You want to make a big bet on the underdog. Right. Now you take plus seven for whatever your maximum bet is, and the line, the team, the favorite wins by six. You win your bet, but your model was off by six, their model was off by one. We had years where our model outperformed their model straight up. So that it meant we were winning those situations like the one I just gave you where we we were off by more than they were, but we still won. And we had ones where we were just way better than they were. Like, let's say your model makes it pick them, they make it seven, and the underdog wins by six. Now your model was off by six again, and they were off by 13. Mm -hmm. And our model was better than theirs for the whole season. Yeah, I could see that. uh, I could see you being able to make some money. (laughs) (laughs) If your model is outperforming theirs, like um, finding... Now they're, obviously, they have better models, you know. Sure, of course. Uh, Nowadays, and, you know, a line moves instantaneously with computers and information is instantaneous with computers, you know, and the, and you don't have a situation you might have, I don't know, 
a New York team is playing a California team, the coast to coast difference might be a point and a half. Now the coast to coast difference is zero. There's too much arbitrage too fast. Yeah, the, my uh, I have a friend who's like the smartest human I know, and he bets sports for three or four years. Um, and he's someone. It's really funny because he he's a a funny character in that he's the smartest person I ever know. And the first time I met him, um, he was playing a two five home game, and was like a short stacker, like eighty dollars. And he's like just getting his money in and like doubling up and just sitting there and just playing really tight. And I'm just like, man, who is this guy? Like, he just, I, I don't know. I just started talking to him and then getting to know him and then realize that like, it was never about the money for him. It, it's everything is about finding an edge. And like, he knew he had an edge short stacking it. So he just didn't buy in for the max. Like he didn't just buy in for 200 big blinds, even though like he was, uh, way over bankrolled more than anybody at the table by a factor of probably a thousand. Um, he just did what he knew would give him an edge. And, you know, he bet sports. Uh, this is probably five, five to 10 years back now for four or five years. And then he just stopped because he was like, you know, he just couldn't, you know, he couldn't find an edge. Like he just couldn't find edges. And so he just quit betting. And, and I, he was like a solo, <laughs> solo person on his own doing it but like yeah it sports betting is these day this day and age like i just maybe you're smarter than my friend but the odds of it are like one in a million <laughs> um most likely if you're betting sports you probably don't have an edge exactly you know and going back to what you're saying though about buying in with small buy-ins i think that's in general even with an infinite bankroll, it's always good to buy in small. And there are a couple of reasons. The first is you can always add money to the table. There's never, if I go to a Mirage, let's say, and play 510, I think the minimum buy in is 400 and the maximum is 1500 or something. You know, they keep flopping them around. Sometimes it's 2000, sometimes it's 1500. So the, uh, you buy in. For 400. Now, if the game is no good, you sit there and you try and wait for a good spot and you get all in for your 400. If the game is good, you can add in chips. If there's one really weak player, you can try to move to his left and then add in chips. And people, another thing that people do is you can always, normally, you're going to, you've decided, well, my stack is low, I'm down to 200, I want to add in chips. Play around until it's your button. Put in your blinds from the 200 stack. And when it's your button, add in your chips. So you're starting off with the big stack in the best position, which is probably an infinitesimal edge. But why not? You know, what's the point of adding in an extra thousand when I'm going to be the big blind next hand, when I can wait two hands and add in the same thousand with great position? That's you know, so it's funny you say that because it's not, so, I've never even thought about that. And it's so obvious. It makes so much sense. Steve, let's go back to your story. There's so much here to unpack, by the way. And we're quickly running out of time, but I, I a million percent would like to have you back on to hear, especially more stories about the Mayfair Club. And just, yeah, that's just a time that to me, coming up um, as a pro in 2004, you know, you just read stories about it, right? At that point, it's like, it's well, the, mythical. Probably had, as remember, these are all New York intellectuals in general who are very much math science oriented or game playing oriented and also were super ethical compared to the old, some of the old West Coast players or West South Southern players. And those games included, among others, Eric Seidel, Dan Harrington, Howard Lederer were probably the three toughest, but there were Jay Heimowitz, who I think has six or seven bracelets from, you know, he's older and retired now and was always a businessman more than a poker player. Nikki Appleman, again, still plays poker a little bit, probably five or six, you know, these guys all were very good, steady winning players. And it was a super tough game. Plus we would all go out afterwards go to a bar 
talk about hands, you did what, did you consider this? You know, and this was really an introduction to how different people think about different situations. Yeah, and it's it's a classic one plus one equals five type of situation. You know, you have, at that time, you've probably got the t- five of the top 10 to 20 poker players in the world all discussing strategy amongst each other and all improving um, their edge. And like, you know, we talked about at the very beginning of this conversation, right? Where like different people see things differently and, you know, we may each make 200 mistakes, but only a hundred overlap. Well, that's a good way to gain visibility of the mistakes that don't overlap from both sides and, you know, plug those leaks and just improve exponentially kind of as a collective, you know, it's not like you're, it's, it's almost not like your intent is to improve as a collective. It's just a natural consequence of you all loving poker and discussing strategy amongst yourselves. And I think that's happened, you know, back in the days when it was Doyle and uh, Amarillo Slim and uh, Sailor Roberts. Sailor Roberts, yeah. right. That, that group of, uh, of three of them drove from game to game. And Puggy Pearson might have been around then too. And uh, Johnny Moss. And, you know, they talked about poker. And then the very recent example was that whole group of German guys who all. You Fedor, know, they, Rainer Kempa, all those right, guys. Exactly, you know, and the one that, you know, the goose or whatever, you know, all these guys talked and played and talked and played and analyzed. And it's a very good way to strengthen your game. Yeah. I talked about it with, um, with Fedor on the show where it's basically, you know, and with those guys too, they had the benefit of playing online poker too. So playing so many more hands, right? just over a short period of time than like y'all did, you know, back, back in the day, but like play 40 hours of online poker for a week, you see however many hands, 15, 20,000, and then you have a discussion amongst yourselves and you're able to distill what you've learned over the course of that week. Well, now you've transferred that information to another person who also played 40 hours and they transfer that information to you. And then like, it's very easy to see where you're playing 40 hours a week and then you're discussing um, with other people who have played 40 hours and you're just, you're just getting, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hours of wisdom and knowledge and growth every single week. And you have the great tool of the, the HUDs that keep records so that, you know, the data. I can, yeah. I can go back and say, let me look at every hand I've played on America's card room in the last year. Let me look at what I've done in the big blind. What, let me look at, do I defend the big blind enough? Do I defend the button too much? Do I try and bluff, you know, whatever, you know, that that's something that we just had to try and do that intuitively, which is very hard. You don't realize in the spur of the moment, hey, I'm playing too many hands in situations where I shouldn't just be calling a raise. Right. Anyway, do you, we can certainly schedule a, Another one in a couple of weeks or so, whatever you want to do. Yeah, for sure. We, we both said we're, we're sitting around not doing very much, you know. Um, let's uh, <laughs> say that again. Unfortunately. Yeah. I, mean, I, was, I was planning on going back to New York in August, then going on to the World Series and the High Rollers in September, and now all of that. I mean, I'm never that happy with the hygienic conditions at the Rio in the best of times <laughs> during a pandemic. Sure. Um, yeah. So let's talk about you entering poker specifically. We haven't even gotten to that part of the story yet. You know, you're, you're out of, you're out of the sports betting game and you're healthy and you're able to play poker. So, so like, what did that, path look like? I assume this is like after the Mayfair club too, because a lot of those guys, Howard Letter and stuff were involved in the sports betting thing, right? And also we're more West, I'm more Las Vegas full time than New York full time. Sure. And were, you know, when you play in private games in New York, well, there are two, there's an important thing that over the years of playing in private games, you want to be somebody who gets invited to the good game which means you have to be personable and fun and 
if somebody loses and has a post-dated check, you have to say, sure, no problem, I'll take the post-dated check. You have to be the guy who, you know, goes out for drinks with the big loser and says, come on, let's go out for drinks sometime. And, you know, it's it's a lot of social skills. And at various times, people get used to playing in casinos. They're nasty to the other people. They're lecturing the other people. They're throwing cards at the dealers. What, what you know, that how are you ever going to, you know, nowadays within casinos, even they have some sort of quasi invitational only games. You're not going to be invited if people don't want to play with you. You know, there's nothing, there's nothing more, you know, if the best game in town doesn't want you, you're out of luck. And, you know, I've had, I, I've, this is a thing that's kind of sprung up fairly recently in live poker. Like since, you know, I've been playing online, you know, for the last like seven years or so. And it's something that's sprung up since then on like a big level, the private and invite only games within a casino. And I see both sides of it. Like I, I went and played po- live poker for the first time in a few years, just a few months ago. A friend of mine lives in Atlanta and wanted to go on just a trip for a weekend to Cherokee and play some cards. So I went and you see like people are shitty. Like in, in an open invite game, people are just shitty to each other. Like it's always the person that like thinks they know more about poker than they actually do that just talks down to people and treats people poorly and it's like, man, like this, you're, you're making this environment not fun. And it just makes it very obvious to me why these private games or invite only games exist because some people are just shitty and miserable and you don't want to sit at a table with them because they just, they're awful. No, I mean, you really do want to make it an environment that somebody wants to play in. You know, some, when you're talking about a rich guy, he has a lot of choices of what he could do. You know, and if you don't make it entertaining for him, why should he decide, oh, I'm going to go to Aria and play poker tonight? I can just, he can just as well say, I'm going to go out to dinner. I'm going to yeah. buy a boat and go on Lake Mead. You know, what, what they're not going to, they don't want to jump through hoops to lose their money, right? They, they want to have fun. They don't want it to be a hassle to lose their money. I mean, you see so often in the private or semi private games, you know, Somebody will say, okay, let's do a round of shots. And everybody does a round of shots. Or they say, let's, you know, let's take a break and we'll all go out to dinner. Or we'll bring in gourmet food. You know, that kind of thing really. Chip Reese, the late Chip Reese, was one of the best. At, if anybody was a losing player and they told a joke, no matter how bad it was, he laughed, he'd repeat it, he'd say, what a great joke it was. If they were there with their wife and they'd say, well, my wife wants to go out shopping, so I'm going to go out shopping with her. And he'd say, no, no, don't worry. I'll call my wife. She knows all the best stores. They can go out shopping while we play. Let, know, me, was- let me ask you a question, Steve, because how do you do that like in an authentic way? Because like obviously people, there are people that can like laugh at jokes in a way that is not authentic, and everybody knows that you know they're just bullshitting, right? Well, I think part of it is, I think at least for myself, I'm genuinely interested in people. So same, when I, same. You know, you want to hear somebody, well, you do this cast, you know, I mean, you, you want to hear people's stories and their lives and somebody says, I mean, it's an amazing thing when you, I was playing next to Bill Klein, who I knew was a billionaire or something and has a lot of money and we're talking. And first of all, he's very smart. Second of all, he's very funny. Third of all, he had a throat operation, so he can't eat solid food. He had throat cancer. So you find out a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, to to give you one of his one-liners, we're playing in this high roller event, and he's Phil Helmuth is seated between the two of us. And they're talking about the guy comes over, says, last call for food. So a couple of people order things, and Phil Helmuth says, I'd like one of those fancy cheeseburgers from the new place at Aria. And Phil Klein turns to him and says, you better tell him to wrap it to go. (laughs) By the time it got there, Phil had been knocked out and there was a cheeseburger (laughs) sitting in its little to-go bag and we were laughing about it. Uh, See, that's another part of it too, right? Like most people that play, especially somebody that plays like Chip Reese, right? They're very successful in life. And they're almost always a very intelligent, very interesting human being. 
So like, you don't really have to be inauthentic to laugh at their jokes. Just because like, you can play poker better than someone while also enjoying their company and being inquisitive and curious and just getting to know them as a human being. And I think that's really, that's really the crux of it, right? It's not like, it's not doing it just to do it because you think you have to. It's doing it because you're genuinely curious about other human beings. And this is an interesting person. And when you get to know them, it's very easy to be personable. You know, and a lot of poker players have other lives that turn out to be very interesting. You know, they used to be in some sport and very good at a sport, or they used to be an artist or an actor or a writer or they're porn star. Their porn star. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I ever was a star. I was a, a supporting actor or something. <laughs> the, the, yeah, the coast, the, what's the word? I, I'm losing it. Um, you're a character actor. That's the, actor, yeah. There you go. A little bit of stuntman stuff, but mostly character acting. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes, you know, but, but as uh, I'd always played poker, and then you know, since a lot of times when we bet on sports, we'd go to the poker game and play while we were waiting for results to come in and things. So it was always, you know, I was around the people. I played for years when the Mirage first opened up. Uh, we we get new games came in that at least for an, initially. Some of us had experience in like Omaha eight or better. I don't think Chip and Doyle had ever played those games. And suddenly, you know, for a month or two, we were <laughs> tougher than they were. Then the next month they were as good as we were. And six months later, they were much better again. You know, so it was, uh, but I played in a game with Todd Brunson and Mike Matisau and Guy Curtis, who's passed away. My God, the number of people who have passed away recently too, is they just told me Lane Flack and, had died and I was talking with them. We were talking about best stories of people who had won a poker tournament. And I mentioned that Lyle Berman won a poker tournament and some starry eyed girl comes over to interview him after the tournament and says, Oh, Mr. Mr. Berman, you've just won $400,000. What are you going to do with that money? And he said, well, I'm just going to put it with all the rest. You know, it's like, ho-hum, what's going on? <laughs> yeah. And Lane Flack came back telling the Thor story that is another wonderful story. He won a poker tournament, I think, for around a million. And again, the starry-eyed girl comes over and says, oh, Mr. Hansen, you've just won all this money. What are you going to do with it? And he said, well, I'm going to pay a few debts. <laughs> what are you going to do with the rest? And he said, they'll just have to wait. <laughs> uh, yeah that's uh i was i had justin saliba on just like a week or so ago he won a 5k bracelet in wsop event and um we were talking about how you know it was like a few hundred thousand dollars and it was like yeah well you know he just played a 50k and lost <laughs> like you know a few hundred thousand i mean it sounds good on paper but like when you look at it in the big scheme of things there's it, it sometimes it just you know gets you to close to being even <laughs> he's, he's one of the better players who's come out of this very careful analysis and pio solver and I'm, I'm sort of friendly with him and you know talk about things and whatever and uh yeah i mean he's from that background i think he's one of the better ones these days yeah, he's a poker coaching guy. Hilariously, he was, I, I mentioned this in the podcast that I did with him, but he was my contact at poker coaching. So like, and I'm very removed from the MTT side of poker because I've just always played cash and I haven't played a ton of tournaments. And so like, Justin was basically the middle guy between me and Jonathan and Justin like, you know, asked me what I'm webinar I'm going to do and what day and we do the logistical stuff and so like i didn't even know that like he was a high level poker player just because he was just like my connection to poker coaching and then um somebody was like oh no like yeah he played a 50k and oh, oh no he uh <laughs> he just won a bracelet and i'm like oh shit like i thought he was just a dude that worked at poker coaching <laughs> yeah he and i were at a final table in the a 10k final table at the high roller event and uh... 
he he probably was about as car dead as you're ever going to see anybody. I mean, I was kidding, you know, the, for the first hour or something, his VPIP was zero. <laughs> well, in live poker, you know, that's only 30 hands, so not not too many hands you, you get to see. Steve, I, I think we'll leave it here because in the second the second part of this, you know, I would like to get into the Larry Flint game, some of the, the higher stakes games that you got into and played and those stories that's I'm very interested in all all historical poker stuff because like I told you earlier, you know, the Mayfair Club is like mythical to me and Doyle and Chip and Sailor Roberts, like those were the stories that I read as an aspiring poker player and it's like you know, it's just they're legendary to me and hearing those are just oh man, can't beat it. Well, there's certainly a lot of good stories from the Mayfair days. Of, uh, well, I'll save them. We'll do. We'll do some stories for the next podcast. Yeah, we'll just we'll tease it, um, and we'll let, we'll close this one with. Uh, if anybody out there on the World Wide Web wanted to learn more about you, where would they? Where would they go? Or if you don't want them to know, then don't tell them. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I sort of have shied away from social media when I was a red pro at Full Tilt, somebody set up a Facebook page for me and I think a Wikipedia page. And I think most of the information is wrong and they're way out of date. So <laughs> I don't know. I think uh, you just have to assume that my life is one big secret. Oh, I know what they do. They email you and then I'll talk about it in a podcast. There you go. There you go. That That's Brad at ChasingPokerGreatness.com. I'll, I'll be the, you know, the conduit there. Steve, great having you. I've genuinely loved loved this. Thank you very much. It's been an honor. And um, we'll do this again in a couple of weeks, barring any unforeseen thing with the pandemic, but it doesn't look like it doesn't look like much is going to change on that front. I mean, I'm you know, I'm basically a East Coast liberal guy, but I have sort of libertarian things in terms of I think the government makes too many stupid rules. Certainly the rules concerning gambling and drugs and drinking. You know, why should they be different in every state and every county and every bar? You know, that I really do object to, that they're taking away freedoms for no reason. When you come to something like getting vaccinated or wearing a mask, that to me, it's not a freedom. You're you're putting other people's lives in danger along with you. You know, it's like if I'm from London and I say, well, I like to drive on the left side of the road. I don't care what the law is here. <laughs> My freedom to drive on the left side. No, you're putting a you know you're putting a lot of people besides yourself in danger, and you the government just should step in. Absolutely, and, and like I'm totally in agreement, especially like with drugs and stuff like that. Of like your like anything that you put in your body, like that's sort of your choice, right? And but this is affecting other people's lives. And that's where, you know, the line gets drawn of like, you know, it's not, it, it, it's not your right to infect someone else with a virus that could end their life or se severely impact them over the long haul. As a matter of fact, I think it's our responsibility to not do that and try and care and genuinely have empathy for our fellow man. I mean, it just to me is astonishing when I, when I see some of these things. And I can understand, yeah, we want to get businesses open. Yeah, we want to go back to, but, you know, do it in a sensible way. You know, it's a, the poker had opened. You were playing behind plastic barriers, wearing masks. Then it got loosened up and you could do anything. And, you know, now they're going to be back to masks in Las Vegas and, if they don't do something about Delta pretty soon, it's going to be back to plastic partitions, you know, or we'll just be playing online. Yeah, it's the the flow of information, I think. Um, the flow of information just creates a lot of confusion. And that's really, the I think, the problem that I've already, I'll always noticed that, like, anything that I've been a part of that's been in the news, so, like, home game gets raided or something like that, the information's always inaccurate. <laughs> like... From the jump, it's always inaccurate. And then like over time, maybe it gets, um, you know, it gets better over time as they learn more. But like nobody keeps reading about a story like 
a month after it's been a story because nobody's interested in it anymore. And like that just can create a lot of confusion among society where like don't wear masks, do wear masks. And then people are like, ah, oh, they're lying to us. No, they're not lying. They're just being very imprecise and getting information out too quickly. Um, that turns out to be not great information. You know, and this is, it's like the first time you play a new poker variation, you have to learn. This is the first time we've dealt with this type of thing in this situation. And you think, well, this is going, going to work. No, it's not. Try this instead. No, that, you know, it's like we're, the scientists are feeling their way along with everyone else. Absolutely. They're not like superhuman, right? Like they don't have the answers. And we have to give people permission to be wrong and change an opinion. It's not like a weakness of character to have an opinion, get data that influences a change of that opinion. That's just being intelligent. You know, and going back to the government, when you say they raid a local poker game, that to me, why on earth would the government care if a bunch of people want to get together and play poker? It's like they have state lotteries, they have horse racing, they have high lie, they have, you know, so we're not going to let a, people play poker. Oh, they're, it's okay if you don't rake the game, but if you do rake the game, then it's not okay, or it's, uh, you know, if you want to pay your rent through the poker game. Anyway, it's craziness. Okay. Yeah, Arbit so, arbitrary rules for just arbitrary rules for arbitrary things. I um, have to go back and see if we've broken my email somehow. <laughs> have to agree with it. I don't think I did it. I, I'll take responsibility, but I, I don't think it was me. 151 was the time the last <laughs> one came in, and then it seemed like it died, so I don't know. Maybe I changed some setting of something. I don't know what I'd run. Well, Steve, we'll, uh, we'll talk soon one way or the other. We have each other's numbers and looking forward to part two, man. Okay, great. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Chasing Poker Greatness. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts or on your favorite podcast app. Go to ChasingPokerGreatness.com to get the newsletter. Join the Greatness Village community book a coaching session, or dive into the latest data-driven poker courses. Follow the show on Twitter at CPG Podcast.